Hello and welcome to Build Back Better, another online conversation from For the Region. Today we're hosting a roundtable discussion about regional transport in partnership with the Swansea Environmental Forum. Now this is in preparation for our regional transport conference moving forward together, which is coming up on the 9th and 10th of February. We do hope you're all registered to attend that conference. But in the lead up to that event, we thought it would be helpful to have a general panel discussion with a number of experts from across the region about transport in South West Wales. What's currently happening? What do we think needs to happen? What are some of the priorities and main talking points? So that's what today's conversation is all about. Um, we're delighted to welcome a number of thought leaders in this space. We've got Christine Boston from Sustrans. Jane Cornelius from Swansea University, formerly Switch Regional Travel Plan Coordinator. Delighted to welcome Geoffrey Davies from Dancer Community Transport. Mark Barry, who's Professor of Practice in Connectivity at Cardiff University. Ben George, Strategic Development Programme Manager for Swansea Bay and West Wales at Transport for Wales. We've got Alan Kreppel, who is the former chair of Traveline Cymru. Andrew Davies, former chair of the ABMU Health Board. Tom Porter from Public Health Wales. Mary Sherwood from Fairer Future. And my co-host for today's session is Phil McDonald from the Swansea Environmental Forum. Um, so we all know that we're in a climate and ecological emergency and we really uh, need to do something about this to reduce our carbon emissions in all the ways uh, that, that society uh, functions. Um, since 1990, uh, UK carbon emissions have actually decreased by a whopping 40%, which is quite encouraging, but that is largely down to changes in the way we generate our electricity, um, moving from coal to renewables, of course, uh, greater energy efficiency, um, particularly with um, industry, and of course a decline actually in, in energy intensive uh, industries. But emissions from transport are not really that much different to 1990, um, despite improvements in engine and fuel efficiency. Um, because as we probably are all aware, um, the number of vehicles on our roads have continually uh, increased. And transport um, is actually the, the, the largest source of carbon dioxide emissions uh, across the UK accounting for about a third um, if, if we look at the, the emissions in, say, 2019, before the, the COVID uh, um, pandemic. Um, in Wales, transport is actually only the third highest emitter, but nevertheless, it contributes somewhere around about 17%. And as we all know, the, the car is dominant, isn't it? Um, road traffic in, in Wales actually uh, reached its, its highest recorded ever level in uh, 2018. Um, but the number of journeys that we take on the bus in Wales, uh, unfortunately, um, we've seen a decline in that. Uh, over the last sort of decade, um, bus travel has actually declined by between a quarter and uh, a fifth, which is very worrying. I think one interesting thing is that during the um, the first COVID lockdown, we, we all saw a massive reduction, didn't we, in, uh, in travel in general, uh, and also then the associated emissions that came along with most of the way that we travel and transport things. But when the restrictions were actually eased, car travel, car use bounced back rapidly, uh, so much so that in July last year, um, car use was back at around about 80% of pre-lockdown mm. levels, while public transport, it only recovered by about a third to pre-lockdown levels. So this kind of sets the, the <laughs> problem that we've got in dealing with carbon emissions from, um, from vehicle use, uh, road use from cars. 
So we're talking about climate emergency there, which um, for us at For the Region and for you at Swansea Environmental Forum is the major imperative for all our activity. But when you talk about um, emissions and pollution, um, we're also talking about the, the health impacts of that, aren't we? Um, Tom, you work with Public Health Wales. Um, presumably, you've been collecting and looking at the data. I mean, we know that air quality has a massive impact on health. Talk to us about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, uh, Phil mentioned about climate change and, and don't get me started on the health impacts of climate change, because I think we, we often forget about those directly. But actually, if you look at air pollution, um, Across the UK, it's estimated that around seven to eight months of life expectancy for everyone is reduced uh, due to the air pollution. Now, for some people, that'll be less, but for some people, that will be more. Uh, so that's quite significant. And I suppose intuitively, I think we can realise that air pollution affects the lungs. That seems to make sense. And we know certainly the people who have asthma or COPD, um, that does have an effect of exacerbating that. And, and I should say there's no safe level of air pollution that we're aware of. So from from background levels right up to some of the levels we're seeing in our urban areas, um, it's very dangerous. Um, but I suppose the thing that always interests me the most is that air pollution doesn't just affect our lungs, it affects a lot of our organs across our body and it's not just in adults and children, it's actually even before birth. Um, about a fifth of low birth weight babies are thought to be due to air pollution, but it's not just an impact on them when they're uh, a baby, um, but it actually has an impact throughout the life course. So it has an impact on their educational prospects, on their job prospects and on their general health as well. So what happens is that we take something which is a background air pollution and it impacts on somebody throughout their whole life course. And I suppose the extra kicker to that is that we know that, and I know we'll discuss this later on this, this morning as well, uh, the, the rates of air pollution are higher in areas that are more deprived generally as well. So you take areas with most deprivation and then introduce a whole generation's worth of additional deprivation. So you're exacerbating and renewing that cycle of deprivation as well. So there are a whole load of, of health issues. Air pollution is only one of them, but air pollution is, is a really significant issue um, which we do need to grapple with and, and we mustn't shy away from. A mother is more susceptible to air pollution in the second trimester of her pregnancy when the small airways are forming. And what they've found, some research I think from Alderhey Children's Hospital in Liverpool, has found that um, if a mother can't get a break from polluted air and is stressed, and there's a really crucial link there, if she's stressed, she's more susceptible to the ill effects of air pollution. So air pollution is worse for people on low incomes. If you're suffering the stress of trying to juggle, juggle money, a very, very stressful life when you're on a low income and you're in a very polluted area, um, then things are gonna be worse for you and for your children. And as Tom has said, for the whole duration of their life. I, I, I implied then, I said that, you know, air pollution is only one aspect of, of the health uh, side of this. And I think in traditionally in public health, we've very much had a focus within transport on active travel and said people should be walking and cycling because it's good for their cardiovascular health and getting them out of their seat. I, I totally agree with that. That is important. But I think we sometimes miss the, the wider, the, the more holistic picture about the impact of our transport system. Um, so, yes, absolutely. We can improve cardiovascular health. Um, and we can Im improve obesity and sedentary behaviour. I mean, if we think about our, our current lifestyles, and dare I say it, they're probably even worse now with lockdown. But if you, if you look pre-lockdown, for a lot of people, their life was, you wake up from bed, you go and sit and have breakfast, you, you walk to the car, sit in the car, sit in the office, sit in the car to come home again, sit and watch telly and then go to bed. And that's not what our bodies were designed to do. Our bodies were designed to be active and outside and engaging with other people. If we sit in a, a one tonne lump of metal when we're going to and from work, then we're closing ourselves off from, from the wider society. So we need to look not just at the physical side of health, which is, is really important around the impacts of, um, of transport on health, but also on the mental well-being sides as well around social isolation and, and how we design our urban environments around transport has an impact on that and loneliness. Um, we've talked about air pollution and the inequalities there, but also inequalities around people being struck by cars. You know, you, young children, the biggest cause of death in, amongst young children is being hit by a car. And they're not going to face a, a chance, are they, um, when being faced with a, a one ton lump of metal. But not only are they more likely to be uh, hit by a car, is that the commonest cause of death, but that's more likely in more deprived areas as well. So that has a real impact as well on health inequalities. And then I, I mentioned, and I, I won't go into lots of detail, but climate change is here. And it has health impacts and it has health impacts in the UK 
And we're, we're seeing in the news just today that we've got amber and yellow weather warnings across the UK due to flooding. And flooding has real health impacts and well-being impacts on people. And there have been a number of studies of flooding across the UK and what impacts those have. So, sorry, that's a bit of a rant, but just to say that health, it's not just about physical health and active travel. It's about how we design our, uh, our transport systems, how we integrate those across different modes and, and the wider and broader impacts of those. Transport is gendered. And this is something that doesn't get talked about very much. There's a, a huge body of research that says that women and men use transport differently. Um, women need to make a lot of short journeys that chain together conveniently. Um, one of the most challenging decisions of my life was buying a baby seat for the back of my bicycle. <laughs> and I mean, she was a baby. It, it was like, it was going back to work after maternity leave. And I realized that there was no possible way to get to the nursery and to work and be there on time other than to ride my bike. Uh, the, there's, the, the buses don't exist. So um, although women use buses more than men, men use trains more than women, when you look at the investment across the UK over the last 15 years, it's all been in rail. There's been massive, massive investment in rail and hardly anything uh, in buses or other localized transport that allows women to do these short journeys that they need to do to get around their lives. So the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, really ever since they, they first began a century ago, um, they've been looking at what goes into um, a basket, a shopping basket to uh, provide you with life's basic essentials for a decent standard of living, not a luxury standard of living, not treats, just the basics to survive. Transport is an essential need. Transport is a basic service that everybody needs. And how are you gonna get that transport need met? And what they do in costing up the basket of goods is they, they say, okay, what's the bare minimum? What's the cheapest way that we can do this thing? And since 2014, they said, if you have children in your household, the cheapest way to get around to all the places you need to get to is to have a car. And that is shocking because having a car is really, really expensive. It's really expensive. So to say that that's become the most affordable, the most financially realistic way to get around is, is atrocious. So then the, the car goes in the basket of essential goods and that pushes up the amount of money that you need to have coming in to attain a basic decent standard of living. So a lot of people still can't afford that. They can't afford a car. So what do they do? They pay massively over the odds, a short journey, you know, pence per mile um, for buses is shocking or more frequently these days, taxis, because the buses simply aren't there. Um, so this prevents people from accessing employment, education, you know, all kinds of opportunities are denied because people simply can't afford to get from A to B. And those people who can afford to get from A to B are doing it in a massively polluting fashion that is destroying the health of those people who can't afford to get from A to B. Over time, there's been a, a very marked improvement in air quality in the UK. Uh, I remember the time when domestic houses were, you know, we had coal fires, uh, electricity was generated by, by coal. That has changed. But what's happened is that the impact of poor air quality, as has been said already, uh, impacts unequally. So, for example, poorer communities are much more adversely affected. Just to put it in perspective, the Royal College of Physicians in 2016 calculated or estimated that 40,000 people a year died as a result of poor air quality. What is it, 90,000 people have, it's estimated now have died from COVID. So this is a significant cause of uh, death and ill health. It isn't just recently we've known about the impact of, air, of poor air quality. We've known for years but nothing has been done about it. And that's why I very much welcome Welsh Government's uh, publication of the Clean Air uh, White Paper last week. However, I suspect Welsh Government wouldn't even have done that if they hadn't actually admitted in the High Court in 2018 uh, that they were in breach 
of the law. They were uh, their actions were unlawful in not having a plan to tackle air quality. Uh, I, I speak as a former transport minister, uh, and I work closely with Alan Kreppel in the industry on, for example. Uh, transferring the rails of the border franchise uh, from the uh, UK government to, to Welsh government, and I was responsible for managing that. But also, more importantly, in this context, the Transport Wales Act 2006. So that's my point about legislation. It's all very well having legislation. It's all very well having action plans, but they've got to have teeth because that, two, that, that 2006 Transport Wales Act has never been enacted. And and that is my point, is that increasingly the courts are going to get involved in these issues. Public bodies will be held to account and may well be found guilty and have to pay considerable um, penalties for poor air quality. Are we measuring air quality? Um, do other local authorities aware of air quality in local areas? Last January, the, the London-based think tank, the Centre for Cities, uh, published a, a report on air quality. And just to put it in perspective, on a per capita basis of all the cities in the UK, Swansea has the worst air quality. That's per 10,000 population. And that's on nit nitrogen dioxide and particulate, particularly uh, PM 2.5. So this is, this is not, uh, you know, an abstract issue. This is something very, very local. And in Equal Talbot, uh, everybody says, oh, well, you know, the steelworks. Well, the steelworks does have an impact, but actually the, the motorway and road traffic in terms of nitrogen dioxide probably has as bigger impact in Port Talbot and Neath. And if you look at the map of the distribution in, uh, in Wales of nitrogen dioxide, you can see it's not just urban areas, but it's the trunk road network where the concentrations of nitrogen dioxide are the highest. Brings us on to talk to Jeff Davies from the Dancer Community Transport uh, in Neath Patalbert yeah. and uh, the Valleys. So a bit of the history for, for Dancer so far, for those who are not familiar with us. Um, we're an amalgamation um, of the former Dillis Valley um, uh, Community Transport and uh, Bustler, which was uh, serving the Swansea area. Um, we've almost now 20 years of experience uh, working closely with uh, local authorities and community community organizations to provide uh, sol solutions for our users. As I said earlier, we're based in the Dilai Savan, Neath, Swansea and Ammon Valleys, hence the name Dancer. And we're a not-for-profit community transport organization. And we aim to provide um, transport services to people who live in these areas who, are not, who do not have um, access um, for conventional transport arrangements. So we provide um, a, de a demand responsive community transport service to um, Swansea uh, to Swansea for groups and individuals who live in the urban areas of Swansea. So um, we designed to meet the needs of the older people, people with disabilities and people who are unable to, um, like I said, access the conventional public transport and we also aim to meet the needs of uh, charities and other organizations that require accessible, affordable transport to ensure our service users, group members, and, other, um, are, and others are able to access the services and active, uh, um, activities that they provide. So we have a number of vehicles ranging from cars, MPVs, 16-seat uh, minibuses, and 30-seat minibuses. And like I said, um, the majority of our vehicles are fully accessible and therefore able to uh, transport the passengers who use wheelchairs. Uh, sadly, um, all our vehicles are uh, the traditional diesel combustion engines. Um, we recently put in a bid together and fingers crossed that we can move into um, electric vehicles. Um, so we're trying to get... Um, funding for a car and uh, a minibus, um, hopefully by the end of the financial year. And um, we uh, vehicles are driven by volunteers, paid staff, and um, are fully made us trained. So um, we're there to su support the needs of the community. Um, during 2019, we, we provided transport for over 75,000 people in uh, Neathport Talbot. 
Um, and we have um, over 4,000 registered, um, currently over 4,000 registered members. So it's basically identifying the need for the users, understanding the locality. Um, we're able to go to people's homes to pick up the users rather than uh, the users having to access the local bus stop. Uh, the vehicles, obviously, some of them smaller, so we're able to get into smaller uh, housing estates and um, and um, cul-de-sacs uh, to pick up our users. And we're basically, basically flexible and we'll, we'll bend to, to meet the needs of our users. So, um, but, but looking at some figures, um, approximately 65% of our users are, are, are on the traditional bus services that we provide for Neath Portal, but 65% of them are elderly. Uh, a further 15% are disabled. Sadly, only 2% are, are of um, youth age and 18% then are fair paying kind of passengers. So you can say from the age of say 20 to um, 60 years of age, then um, only 18% um, um, are fair paying passengers. But um, and looking at some figures for, for the environmental side of things as well, um, our uh, analysis was saying that um, it's approximately 13 pence per mile um, on a typical uh, diesel combustion engine vehicle for a car uh, against uh, four pence per mile um, um, for an electric vehicle. So fingers crossed um, we, can, um, we can move into that and, and align ourselves with Welsh Government's strategy on decarbonisation. Um, us as an organisation, just on fuel alone, we 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 produce uh, 140 tons of um, CO2, which is um, to get rid of that, you need to um, um, plant 280 trees annually. No, I think it sounds like um, uh, community transport fills a, a vital need um, where the big bus companies and transport companies just are not meeting the needs of local people, particularly, as you say, the elderly and the disabled. Yeah, and I, th I think it's, uh, it's, it's a number of um, reasons why we are where we are today. For instance, just in the Dillice Valley alone, uh, um, a mining valley and... Um, People didn't need cars uh, or anything then. They literally just walked to work, whereas uh, there's more need now for some transport to get to your place of work. And I also think as well, we're most probably at the end of a generation where um, the people who predominantly use our uh, buses now never owned a car in their lives, whereas uh, you only got to go outside uh, somebody's house and... Um, there's four or five cars parked outside their house. Um, each child has got a car. Um, the, the husband, the wife um, has, got, has got a car and um, it's, very, it's very difficult. And Jeff's just hit the nail on the head. People used to live in a community. The school was there, the re relatives were there, the work was there. We've now allowed through the planning process for multiple journeys having to be made which is often a lot longer than it was and a lot more complicated. And, and Mary's already mentioned the, the, the fact that many journeys now are not a simple single journey. It's to drop you know, the child off to the nursery to pick up a bit of shopping, to go and you know, drop into work or whatever. Um, and it is very complicated. And I don't think uh, collectively we're very good at measuring what people want, which is how people move, why they move, and how those moves are best met. And technically, it's quite easy to do because most people have got a mobile phone and the mobile phone companies can track us and see exactly what they do and produce demand lines in any town or city. So you can see what the demand is for transport relatively easily. But that information doesn't seem to be used by us collectively to then design our transport networks. And most people making journeys move under eight miles. So we're talking about a journey that you could walk in three hours, you could cycle in just over half an hour, or you could do a five or 10 minutes in the car. And we keep trying to use, it seems to me, traditional methods of dealing with that issue because we've made it worse by what we've done on planning and we still allow to happen. So if you 
start thinking outside the box and saying, look, the bus is not working on these short journeys. Um, it's too far to walk. A lot of Wales is hilly. The, you know, we've got inclement weather. Are you really going to get a huge number of people on their bikes and out walking, particularly when you've got young kids? And the answer is realistic. No, no. we've allowed and deliberate policy has been to let bus fares rise and rail fares rise. So they're out of reach of many people now. They just cannot afford them. So if you just put all that in a box and start thinking outside that box and say, how are we going to deal with this? then you have to start inventing new, new ways of doing it. And if I, I mention a, a rude word, Uber, okay, and everyone is probably going to go, oh, yeah. Um, but actually, the Uber concept uh, with refinements is a very good concept. Uh, and I've talked to Andrew before about uh, university campuses and hospitals being right next to each other and producing huge demand which is 90, 95% um, car-based. If you look at that Uber concept, it's just software-driven, which is people want movement, a, a vehicle turns up, it takes them to want to go. If you expand that and say, hang on, there are some big areas of demand where people want to go, Singleton Campus, Singleton Hospital, DVLA, you, you know, even, even big suburban shopping centres. And so supposing we introduced that Uber concept, with a vehicle that was an electric vehicle, which was um, on real time, it works exactly the same way as Uber, but three, four or five people can get into it if they're all going to the same place at the same time. Then you start moving things forward. It just seems to me that there are some quick wins that if we all work together across the authorities, you know, with Welsh government support, then we can really start moving things quickly. But there's just one other thing I would say on conventional public transport. One of the killers of buses has been traffic congestion and the way highway engineers have actually done but the bus services a, a, a disservice by not getting them out of traffic and it getting them getting slower and slower. And a single deck bus costs £60 an hour. So if you sit it in traffic for 10 minutes, you, you can work the mass out. Um, and it, it's those sort of things where cars are allowed to block cycle lanes. They're allowed to block the pavement. Mum has to take the buggy in the road where we have just lost sight of the importance of people and that the effect cars are having, not only just on air quality, but quality of life as well. So you're talking about bus lanes, really, aren't you? I mean, I know from living in London, you can sit in traffic in a car in London and you see the buses passing you by and it's quicker to get somewhere by bus so that's one reason why you would want to use your bus and also there's a congestion charge so you're discouraged and the parking is so impossible you would never take your car into central London um, so all those things add up to create modal shift don't they um, and I also remember when it was you know, the Oyster card was brought in, but even before that, you could get on the bus and go where you wanted to go for a pound, so it was affordable. So all those things have really helped to shift London off, off its cars and onto its public transport. I think that's a, a good um, point to bring Professor Mark Barry into the conversation. Um, Mark, you've been very involved in the South Wales Metro project yeah. in the Cardiff city region. A lot of what I've heard already I agree with, some I don't, and I'll explain why. Um, I, but before we, I do, I think we've got to step back, because I think we've all got a collective blind spot. The elephant in the room in is, is car use. You know, pre-COVID, 80% of people were in their cars. Um, and actually, for many people, it's the more convenient and more affordable choice. But we've, we've allowed our lives and our urban realm to be built around cars the last 50 years. And what no one is paying when they get in the car is the full price of car use. Yeah. And we've got to have a serious and sensible conversation about external costs of those choices. They're, they're significant. They're huge. We talked about the healthcare. I mean, I've read the King's Cottage study. I think twenty to 30,000 premature deaths every year because of car emissions every year. There are 150,000 road traffic accidents every year. There are 25,000 ICU-type serious injuries because of car accidents. There are 1,700 deaths five a day. If, if the public transport network did that, it would be closed down and there'd be a public inquiry. Right? So there's huge healthcare social costs. And we're, pay I'm, we're all subsidising that cost. The drivers aren't paying that collectively. 
But more, more damaging, I think, is the long-term induced demand of car use. And even the DFT acknowledges it's very significant, but it's very hard to, to count in transport appraisal for new schemes because it's longer term. And it's very simple. You build a road. The people who go between those points then find it easier to move. But over the next 20 years, people then build stuff around that road, supermarkets, shops, houses that generates more traffic, more demand, and aft often results in all those local journeys we used to rely on being taken away because we're now aggregating things in bigger places. So the, the impact of induced demand is huge and it's really damaged our urban realm. So more journeys have to be made in a car. I think the other big impact that no one's properly measured, and I get into debates, is the fact that retail's got so corporate and so big and so car-based. It decimated many towns, high streets all over the country. And I'll get the discussion about the issues in the valleys about commuting to Cardiff. Commuting to Cardiff is small beer when you compare and look at all the outer town developments, shops and houses and offices all over the place just ripped the guts out of all of our communities. Mm. I, we have to lead, public sector have to lead, and I'm going to point a finger at the health, health boards here. There are too many hospitals we've built in the last 30 years in places you can only get to in a car. You've got Morriston, you've got Royal Glamorgan, you've got, uh, you've got the, the, the um, St. Prince of Wales, you've now got the new Llanfethford Grange Hospital. They're all car-based locations that all require more car journeys. So I, I think we've got a serious conversation about levying on drivers the full costs because they're hugely subsidised. Public transport's not hugely subsidised because all the long-term benefits of public transport aren't counted in that appraisal and all the negative costs of car use are not counted in road appraisal. And so we're in this unvirtuous cycle of more and more stuff having to be built around cars. So I, I agree with free market, but if you want to use a car, you have to pay the full price, and we are not, not by a long shot. And we have to invest in public transport in all. We need railway demand sufficient. We need damn sight more bus, integrated, easy to use. And someone talked about ownership. One of the issues we do have, you know, we've got a very um, centrally controlled rail system. We've got issues in Wales about devolution and powers and funding. The bus network was deregulated in the 1980s outside London. And the fact that bus companies have got a commercial motive to go and drive and, and, and cover their costs, it's very difficult to integrate. We have to have some legislative changes so government or Transport for Wales can offer quality contracts and say, you will run this bus service between these points. You will use this app and integrate it with the rail service so that experts that are being assembled in Transport for Wales, people like Ben and the team, can design networks that combine these different modes to present the passenger the single network. And in the high demand areas, it'll be rail. In the middle, you'll have bus and bus rapid transit. And where demand responsive transit and the kind of call dial-up demand works is areas of low demand where fixed routes are inefficient to operate, where you want the flexibility to respond in real time. If we can link all those together with technology, end to end, you begin to have a transport network that works. But underpinning that, there are some serious legislative issues, some serious institutional challenges, but I say the biggest issue, we've got to cut this. Car is our heroine as a society, right? We're hooked on it. Everything we do is designed around a bloody car. And I, I speak as someone who used to drive two miles every day down the town. I, I, some of you may have heard this story. I had a car, bought newly new 20 years ago, nice car, beautiful car, drove everywhere, drove to the shop. It was, you know, I just was used to doing it. I thought, oh, it's getting a bit old now. I need to replace it. So I got webuyanycar.com to give me a, a quote and they offered me 34 pounds. Right? It was older than I thought. And I thought, you know what? I gave it a charity and I've not used a car since, frankly. So I walk and I cycle and I bus. You know, we have a car in the family. Don't, you know, we, there will still be needed for cars. My wife, she walks over the valleys. But generally, now I make choices where I, I you know, even pre COVID, where I didn't have to get in the car. It's difficult. And I know how difficult it is. Fundamentally, we need all kinds of transport. It needs to be integrated rail, bus, bus rapid transit, bus lanes. Don't get me on bus lanes. You know, people go, oh, no, no, they, they, they're empty most of the time. If you can operate with bus lanes, you need fewer vehicles, you need less drivers, operate at a lower cost. It's faster, more frequent, more reliable, more people will use it. I read something you wrote recently, or I think you were quoted as saying, you know, people thought the South Wales Metro would never happen. Even your mother didn't believe it was happening, but it is happening and people should believe that these major transport projects can come off. When you talk about this amazing integrated, joined up, well-funded system, I'm just thinking, well, that's never gonna happen, is it? How, how are we ever gonna get to that point? I mean. 
do you think we should have more ambition and we should believe that we can get this kind of amazing 21st century transport system in our region? You know, Swansea, the urban area of Swansea is 300,000 people. If you look at the, the, the ONS stat, the built up area of Clenethley, the Neath, 300,000 people. There is no dedicated local rail network. There is an opportunity, and Ben's aware of this, we're not going to give too much away, but that's been a lot of work in the last couple of years, for a a dedicated commuter rail network that can then be the backbone of how we integrate bus services into that, using the SDL, using a bit of the main line, but a bit of infrastructure. Um, the challenge, though, is, and I'll come on to this, and Andrew will be aware of this, it, it, rail infrastructure is not a devolved matter. And I'm appearing at the Welsh Affairs Select Committee on Thursday. And I'm a bit, I'm a bit tired of going through the same arguments. You know, Wales has had such a poor share of UK rail enhancement investment over the last 30 years. It's frankly embarrassing. And... I fear there is a good project coming out of Swansea for rail, not hugely massive, but a really substantive foundation around which you can build an integrated transit network. My fear is, no matter how good it is, unless the UK government meet us halfway and recognise there's an obligation to, to, to make up some shortfall, it may never happen. And, you know, I still think there are institutional issues around rail powers and funding. I still think the bus operations and institutional framework for bus operation needs to be looked at. But I do believe the ideas are there now and the capability is being developed. And, I, you know, people, people criticise Welsh Government an awful lot about what they do, what they don't do. But going back to South Wales Metro, it was heresy 10 years ago. Um, my mother still doesn't believe what she does now. I mean, I've told her. But, you know, five years ago, um, I stood with Carlo and Jones at Ponty Police Station when we announced the Metro. In that time, since then, they've created Transport for Wales. They've undertaken the biggest, most complicated procurement in rail industry history, biggest in Welsh government history. They're now via TFW designing the South Wales Metro. In the next three years, even with COVID, they're going to they're turn it on. And I think the problem is people don't believe it because nothing like that's happened before in Wales. Not since the Victorians said, oh, I called it a, I called it a train. Right? So, yes, it can happen in Swansea Bay and it should happen, right? And I think the balance between modes has got to be got right. But if we kind of start pretending we can't, we end up with nickel and dime projects that don't have an impact. So you, you align the vision with a Machiavellian pragmatism about how you get governments to do things, but also a recognition that we've got to deal with our planning systems, transit oriented developments, and deal with this car issue in a, in a complementary way. Not easy, but it certainly is doable. And I think Swansea Bay deserves it. Can I just add that I think we need some quick wins on top of that. We can't wait for all the structural and the, the legislative changes, we've got to go collectively for some quick wings to demonstrate that public transport can do it. I keep saying, get some paint out, put some bus lanes down. You know, if you can start offering fast, you know, even as a private company, I don't care. If you can offer fast, more reliable bus services, people will start using them. Let's get all the work and employment back into places where you can get to on public transport. I'd like to talk to Jane Cornelius. Talk to us about your reflections on what's been discussed so far. Yeah, roughly about, well, it's 19 years ago now, believe it or not, that uh, I was employed by the region and that was Welsh Government funded as part of South West Wales Integrated Transport Consortium. And I honestly feel we've made a huge backward step by removing the travel planning function within the regions. Um, because what we did, I was working with over 100 businesses at the time. I worked with NHS Trusts in 2007. We we launched the first NHS travel planning workshops and we started doing some fantastic work. Um, we also worked with people like DVLA, um, large organi public sector organisations, the private sector organisations. We had annual conferences and we actually shared all of the stuff we were doing with other people. Um, one, so one of the things that I learned from that is that you have to ask people. All of the decisions we make across Wales regarding public transport, getting people out of cars, all of the other stuff is will make no difference at all unless we tailor everything to the needs of people. And that means asking people what they want. And businesses and employers have a massive part in play in, to play in that and what we did is we went into businesses and we promoted everything so we promoted the switch to share uh, car share scheme which was the the most successful car share scheme in wales ever even more uh, more successful than the share camry uh, all wales scheme and the reason for that is because businesses were promoting it. Nobody promoted the Share Cymru Welsh, Welsh Government scheme. I mean, I wonder if any of you here actually knew it existed. 
Switch to Share was recognised, people trusted it, and businesses used it and promoted it. And places like David Powers Police, for instance, uh, promoted it um, and had fantastic uh, outcomes from that. They had lots of their modal shift to car sharing. And a lot of the time in rural areas uh, for longer journeys, that is the, the only option the staff have got to get to work is either to drive themselves or to car share with others. And, and that is something that is very, very much forgotten and is very often not part of the mix when we're talking about promoting um, sustainable travel for the future. I think car sharing has a huge part. Going back to behavioural change, some of the things we, we found, the feedback we found, and it hasn't changed, um, when I'm surveying students and staff at the university, the same sort of uh, answers are coming through. Yes, cost is very, very important. The number one change that we found, behavioural change, from getting people out of their car is you've got to make that journey quicker. There is no point in having a journey of half an hour by car and then if you have to travel by public transport, that journey becomes an hour and a half or two hours. That person will not change their, their mode of transport. Just to give you an example, within, within Swansea University, when I started, 24% of students were using public transport. And to, well, just pre, pre-COVID, so that's five years later, we have 57% of students using public transport. But 12% of the traffic that, or the movements of traffic on Fabian Way, which is a massive route into Swansea, um, was generated by our staff and students traveling actively. So if those students and staff had not traveled by public transport, had not cycled to work, that would increase the volume of traffic on Fabian Way by 12%, I think it is, which is, which is huge. So that is the difference one organization in one campus can make. Uh, what we've done is we've made parking unattractive. We charge for parking. We parking is further away from the from the buildings than uh, cycle facilities. We provide showers. We provide drying facilities. Another major thing, um, and outdoor public workstations. So we've got these little external workstations where you can hang your bike, you can do small repairs, got all the tools, got a pump on it. Little things like that are inexpensive. They make a massive, massive difference to um, your employers um, actually actively traveling. There is an enabler out there to help um, businesses across the Wales to become um, more active, uh, promote active travel um, and it's, it, it's also a way of ensuring that they've got the facilities within their organisations and support for staff. And that is the cycle-friendly employer accreditation. Now, that started in Europe. Um, Netherlands, Germany, all those countries uh, signed up to it. Uh, it came to the UK. It was launched in Belfast. Um, and Sustrans were the, uh, the people auditing it in, in Belfast. Scotland promoted it very, very widely. Um, Wales, to my knowledge, doesn't doesn't promote it very widely. Uh, we were the first employer in Wales to get the accreditation at gold level, which is the highest level. And that accreditation lasts for three years. You get re-accredited in three years time. You do have to pay for it, but I think it's really well worth it. But I think it's something that could easily be um, promoted and, 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 you know, be something that there is a sign that an employer is actually trying to help their, their staff. So those are the sort of things that you can do. But the big, the big thing I want to take away is you do have to tailor it to the needs. And the only way you're going to know with anything is by asking. Um, I, I think it's, it's really sad that we've lost a lot of things. I think it's really sad that we've lost car share schemes and, and, and they do work really well and they do get cars off the road. Public transport is only environmentally friendly and it is only a, a good alternative if those buses are full, if those trains are full. If they're running empty, you may as well have cars on the road. The, the, the mucky, dirty CO2 and all the rest of it is going to be far worse than, than driving a few cars. So... What we found with, um, with our tailored services, 
the buses are running completely full. And anybody that's seen our university buses will see that they are full of shoppers, students, staff. They are running full and that makes them more environmentally friendly. What I want to see next is those buses need to be environmentally friendly buses. They need to be hydrogen and they need to be electric. Even our students say they don't want dirty diesel buses. The car is so ever present now that that becomes the norm. And this idea that everything has to be as good as the car. We also need to think, how do we actually add a bit of friction back to the car journeys? Because we've made cars so easy. Uh, and I, there was a really interesting example that I saw a couple of years ago in uh, a state in America. Um, where they said to the local authority said to uh, local businesses by all means have free car parking spaces but what you need to do is to provide employees who choose not to drive with an alternative and equivalent cash payment yep. for that for that money that effectively you're gifting to people who choose to drive in um, and it worked out at something like 70 or 80 dollars a month that they started having to pay to people who were walking or cycling in and suddenly miraculously overnight a lot of the car parking spaces started to drop away so there is something about leveling that ground so we need uh, carrots absolutely we need to provide really good alternatives but we do need some sticks in there as well to drive behavior change i personally think that you know a ubiquitous fair road user charge with with discounts for appropriate users for white van man for, for freight but we need to disincentivize those ridiculously short journeys that we don't really need to make in the car of which most journeys are uh, a, a, a price to do that would make it more equitable and a fairer reflection of the full cost of car use and then people will make different choices. I mean, you know, the libertarians amongst us who want to say, you know, cars are the libertarian option. Fair enough. Pay the full cost. I ended up working in transport in Wales through my lived experience when I lived in Gwanka Gerwin um, and kind of became familiar with the challenges uh, for families in particular in making multiple journeys you know uh, mums especially you know have to trip chain they're less likely to make journeys from a to b they'll make journeys from a to b to c to d um so you know i could see the challenges around that the um difficulties around getting to a place of work on time um by public transport um you know for the beginning of the working day the challenge in that area um, it would take half an hour to get from Gwanka going to Swansea City Centre in a car. It would take two hours on a bus and you still wouldn't make it for the start of the working day. So, um, yeah, that is what inspired me to start working in uh, Welsh transport. And, um, you know, I've been now uh, kind of in this field for over a decade. But to start off with, I think um, just to briefly introduce Sustrans. So we're focused on delivering health and happiness through the way we travel. Travel. So I know lots of people connect Sustrans as a cycling charity, and that is true um, to an extent. We are custodians of the National Cycle Network and we promote um, cycling as a form of transport for utility. Uh, we also promote walking as well, and we do a lot of work around placemaking, um, you know, making sure that people are connected to the places they need to go and they're able to get there easily um, on foot, by bike, by uh, public transport. So we believe that cities and towns should be places that prioritise people. You know, we need to think about how people live, how they connect with the environment around them um, and make sure that, you know, they want to spend time um, in their local area and that connecting, um, you know, uh, to their environment is an easy and pleasant thing to do. So I think to facilitate modal shift, um, it's a lot about, you know, we've touched on built environment this morning. It is a lot about that, making sure that we are uh, building things, building active travel really in from the beginning when we're putting a new housing development, you know, putting the cycle route in there first. Um, making sure it's connected up to the public transport network. The same with hospitals. Uh, building new houses, they've got storage facilities for bikes. They've got parking facilities for bikes, um, you know, that allow people to make that choice. Um, I think it was Jane saying about, you know, if you move house, um, you know, that's a key time when people might change their behaviour. So make sure those facilities there from the beginning to encourage, to give that positive message around active travel and to make it possible. At the minute, six 62% of the transport capital budget is still being spent on built, building new roads. You know, as I've said, we, we need ambitious leadership. We need brave decision making that shows a commitment um, to addressing the climate crisis. Um, I think, you know, we've seen in the last year we can change behaviour. You know, 
we can drive behavior change when it is urgent um you know it is just a matter of you know the the climate crisis is urgent but it's not it doesn't feel time critical i think that's how people are experiencing it um you know we're not doing that job uh, well enough in in making people understand that for the benefit of you know ourselves now but also our children our grandchildren you know we need critical um, change very urgently uh, and that's a responsibility for all of us but um, we need the investment decisions that ensure that there is a choice there there's been lots of talk about electric vehicles electric cars and you know thankfully thankfully for me you know recognition I would say that electric vehicles should not be what we are you know entirely concentrating on because they don't provide the whole of the solution they may provide some of the solution but I would think that is more around um, shared vehicle ownership is where the opportunities are around electric vehicles um, rather than, you know, individually owned, uh, you know, private transport. So um, it it seems to me that uh, the public perception is that electric cars are the answer and that they have zero environmental impact um, and zero zero harm but you know we've heard lots of arguments in this discussion um, of why that is not the case and I think I just want to add to that um, the point that you know we talked about transport emissions but energy is in the top three highest emitters as well um, so we you know there has to be a lot of caution around moving people um you know reducing emissions in transport just to increase them in energy because we are not positioned to be able to cope if everybody who currently has a car switches to electric um you know i've been leading the community transport association in wales for um a number of years before i joined sustrans and i really think that there is opportunity in um community owned community based um uh, car club car share schemes so it's not a matter of um you know you you can't have a car you should be able to have access to a car when you need it but not need to own the car um so yeah i think that's a, a really important piece of the puzzle there yeah great point to end on there you know the difference between access to a car versus everybody having to own a car to have a decent quality of life um, i think we've touched on so many uh, great topics in this conversation and i hope uh, it really sets a great context for our regional transport conference on the 9th and 10th of february i'm hoping you will all come along to that conference and add into the discussion um, but i think there's so much that we can do um, on a regional and on a local level. And I, I really want the focus to be very much on what we can do. Um, but I take the point from many of the participants in today's conversation that we mustn't give up on major investment and infrastructure changes over the long term. We need to be really ambitious and we need real bold leadership on those major investments. So it's a balance of looking to government um, and looking to local authorities for leadership, as well as engaging with employers and businesses and companies to look at the practical things that they can do and then at a community level how alternative options and ways of meeting local needs um, how we can empower those to make a real difference but we must not lose sight of the absolute imperative you know changes to our transport system are not just a nice to have and wouldn't it be better there is a climate emergency and we must change our transport system we need to adapt it's going to be uncomfortable and some people are going to find travel and transport more difficult um, but the health imperatives the social equality imperatives and the climate imperatives are there, we need to make a change. That's what the conference in February will be all about. I'll look forward to seeing you all there. But for now, thanks very much for bearing with us for this long conversation. I hope it's been of interest and we'll see you again soon. Bye for now.